thank you very much for this kind introduction and thank you for the invitation to come here today. Uh, the topic of my talk today is Soviet paper reuses and waste recovery in the Stalinist economy in the years leading up to and during the Second World War. And I guess it does not really require high rhetorical skills from my side to convince you as an audience based in Finland that paper is a crucial resource. Uh, so I expect you to be the paper experts and I look forward to learn more from you today in our uh, discussions afterwards. Um, I think in times of crisis, like in our digital present, each of us is faced with the daily anxiety of keeping our communication lines open. Will Zoom freeze now or what happened to my backup, the usual panic. So you must imagine that in the previous century of mass print and mass mobilization, uh, access to printing and writing paper and the ability to regenerate and reuse scarce paper resources were questions of uttermost importance to the war economy. In Soviet salvage propaganda, a collection of waste paper featured uh, less prominently than metal scrap, for example. Metal scrap was supposed to magically transform into new tanks and military equipment and so on. In comparison to metal, paper had a much more discreet, invisible coordinating uh, function. But nevertheless, paper was a question of life and death. It was an indispensable prerequisite for the mobilization of all other materials and human resources. So paper ensured communication between front and rear. It mediated letters, news, telegrams, military intelligence, and paper was a vehicle for agitation and propaganda and the psychological um, mobilization of the population. So to uphold itself, the state bureaucracy needed files for registration, cards for resource allocation, and ration stamps, and so on. And I myself, uh, I am a book historian, so my the focus of my talk today will be on cultural paper forms. That means printing and writing paper, rather than, for example, the use of cellulose for military purposes. But as I will demonstrate, uh, paper scarcities blurred the distinction between various paper forms. Um, for example, uh, printed paper was subject to secondary everyday reuses. It was repurposed for the basic needs of keeping clean and keeping warm. And conversely, printing houses appropriated industrial paper types such as packaging materials and wallpaper for printing purposes. So in this talk, I want to demonstrate the many different attempts the Stalinist war economy uh, representatives uh, of the printing, paper and waste recovery industries and the population made both from above and from below to mobilize and to save and restore paper resources. If we look into uh, the research literature, existing environmental history and socialist consumption studies on communist uh, waste recovery have mostly focused on the post-war period. Most notably, Susa Gilles' seminal study on the socialist Hungarian waste regimes uh, after 1948. Uh, Victor has his ongoing project on waste and communism of the Cold War period. And uh, so far, my own publications on this topic have also centered on waste paper uh, campaigns of the late Soviet period. Uh, I have written, for example, about the Makulatura campaign of the 1970s. It was a, a funny bonus system during which uh, readers could exchange 20 kilograms of uh, collected waste paper to obtain a book voucher that they could exchange into a popular book title. And I have looked into uh, visual poster campaigns as the ones you can see on the screen here. 
address that pioneer children and their parents uh, to collect waste in the years uh, from the 50s to the 80s. But in fact, a Soviet system of waste paper handling developed long before that. And for long, it has just remained uh, quite undescribed in research literature. If we compare to the US where waste paper was a highly important raw material in paper production already before the war, the Soviet industry did not possess the necessary technical equipment to transform collected waste paper into new paper. So obviously paper scarcities um, put natural limits, limits to the post-consumption uh, waste paper return rates. But nevertheless, the Stalinist regime did in fact systematize waste paper collection from households at a very early point. Uh, it was part of an advanced waste recovery system founded in 1932 as Soyuz Util, an agency under the People's uh, Com Commissariat of the Light Industry. Um, it was called the All Union Office for Procuring, Processing and Supplying Scrap Materials and Industrial Waste for the Industry and for Export. So in the following, I will look into this, you could call it the reverse side or the reverse logistics of Stalinist industrialization. Uh, first, I will briefly situate the place of uh, paper in Soviet pre-war and wartime production and consumption patterns. Uh, then I will explain the origins uh, and organization of the 1930s Stalinist waste paper collecting system and discuss its uh, economic, its questionable economic uh, and ideological uh, significance. And then I will look at why did, when this advanced system was developed, why was it abandoned again by the 1940s? And finally, I will explain how the war emergency state then made local printers and paper makers and ordinary people reuse paper directly instead of returning it to a centralized system. So I want to argue that the war economy changed uh, people's attitudes towards paper in the USSR. Um, the Soviet Union possessed enormous but largely undeveloped forest and river resources. As you can see from this very rough paper and board production capacity figure, um, the Soviet Union entered the Second World War with much less of a paper reserve than both its future allies and enemies. Uh, in 1939 to 40, the annexation of the paper industry intensive areas of uh, Finnish Karelia and the Baltic states first added significantly to the production capacity, but soon it was hit by the German invasion and genuine paper production then dropped to less than one third between 41 and 42. And the pre-war consumption levels were already at a low stage. By 1940, an average Soviet citizen would spend 5.5 uh, kilograms of paper per year. In comparison, the German figures were more than 30 kilograms per capita per year and the US figures more than 60 kilograms per capita per year. And these low consumption levels obviously limited the potential for returning waste paper back to the industry. So the Soyuz Util office uh, started from a quite diff difficult point. Um, during the paper crisis uh, by the mid 1920s, the paper return rate had been as low as 9% while in Germany at the same time, it was more than 20%. And though the infamous uh, waste paper campaigns or maculatura campaigns uh, also took place during the 1920s, these had been very like aggressive and first of all, ideologically motivated campaigns that aimed at purging libraries and archives of undesirable publications. Uh, so, in 1932, 
as part of the Osaki policies of the time, uh, the USSR emancipated itself from foreign paper imports and then needed to provide a more stable supply of waste paper to the industry, uh, something that would be more stable than, than the previous occasional drives and campaigns had allowed. Um, and because of this, <clears throat> this new agency um, was created. Uh, Sayu Sutil represented a centralization, but also a formalization of the waste trade compared to uh, the previous peddlers who had been tolerated under Lenin's new economic policy in the 1920s. Uh, the scavenger, the poor rag and bone man of uh, the pre-revolutionary class society that you can see depicted on the left side of this slide, um, was no longer a part of the new vocabulary. Instead, it operated with a new set of proletarian professional titles like collector or supplier or sorter and so on. So Sayu so Sutil became responsible for organizing the collection, uh, not only of used paper, but also a number of other materials, uh, non-ferrous metals, textiles, bones, horse hairs, uh, feathers, rubber, uh, and also low quantities of uh, so-called rare luxury waste, uh, such as uh, tin cans uh, or glass, cork, and worn out uh, leather shoes. And if you think of the, the context, we are, we are talking of uh, the hungry years after the Stalinist uh, forced collectivization, where uh, households experienced great scarcities of daily items. So if from in this context, tin cans and leather shoes uh, appear an almost uh, absurd waste category. But nevertheless, uh, these luxur luxury categories also figured in the instructions of uh, Sayur Sutil. Um, then in 1936, during the Stakhanovite uh, campaign that uh, propagandized the overfulfillment of production quota, um, the agency launched a massive optimization plan according to the socialist competition principles um, with the aim of transforming uh, the previously socially marginalized waste pickers into new brigades of collectors, agitators, modern truck drivers, and accountants. Um, and a rational labor division and an effective time schedule should then ensure that these new state representatives um, would be able to collect waste from urban uh, housing communities and uh, the colchoses. So the system worked like this. Each housing committee was supposed to form a contract with the waste collector about the monthly delivery of scrap. Typically that would be between two and four kilograms per household. Uh, and, these, uh, and this would then be divided into different waste categories. And in exchange, uh, the agency then paid small monetary compensations according to a list of uh, fixed prices. So the housing committee assemblies were to agree on either uh, individual household or collective responsibility for fulfilling their scrap quota. And housing com communities who were not able to fulfill their obligations then had to pay fines. So this was a kind of combination of pressure on the households and the bonus system. And uh, these incentives and pressures were supposed to make, were supposed to make uh, each uh, brigade collector overfulfill uh, his, expected, uh, his expected scrap norm. And when you look into the technical booklets, they instruct the collectors to act uh, in a polite manner and to be hygienic and clean and so on, never tolerate fraud. Uh, remember that they 
work on behalf of, a, of the state and that they are obliged to support the authority of Sayusu Til and that they should act in a cultural and honest uh, way and so on. So these new waste practices contribute to the, the overall Stalinist project of mass uh, uh, culturalization, you could call it. Um, you could say that waste collecting united the lowest strata of society with the highest uh, state authority. And if you look at the illustration to, on the right side of this slide uh, to, to the poet um, Demian Biedny's propaganda fairy tale about the utilization night, uh, you can see how the waste collector um, turns into a kind of superman, a giant uh, epic hero. <clears throat> If we then compare to uh, the Nazi uh, zero waste uh, system that was developed in parallel to these efforts uh, during Goering's and Hitler's four year plan from 36 to 1940, um, you can see that the Nazi waste recovery rhetorics primarily addressed uh, housewives. Uh, after its racial expulsion of Jewish scrap traders. Um, in contrast, the Sayus Util system aimed at transforming households into larger living and working entities. In practice, waste collection presumably um, continued to be part of uh, Soviet women's double burden, but the uh, but it, waste collection was not addressed as a particularly female uh, task at this time. Uh, so you should still uh, contained certain elements, uh, not only of social control, uh, but also of social inclusion. For example, uh, um, the agency cooperated with uh, cooperatives of invalids that could be like war veterans from the First World War, the Civil War, who, um, who were then reworking paper scrap into papier-mâché toys and thus regained value as a laborer. And now that, so that you don't think that I'm a Stalinist uh, person or something like this, I should hasten to say that, of course, this waste collecting system was part of a larger repressive system. Um, and it quite ironically, uh, by 1938, uh, the manager of Sayus Util, uh, Alexander Krause, who was a Russian ethnic German, he ended up falling victim to a purge campaign uh, against the ethnic Germans himself, but only after he had developed uh, the most rigid collecting quota scheme ever. Um, though collecting quotas uh, were differentiated according to population density across the union, obligations to collect scrap existed even in third category, so-called third category areas with less than 10 inhabitants per square kilometer. And these obligations uh, must have stripped any secondary materials from the peasants who probably have had less to discard than urban households. So from an economic perspective, this seems quite meaningless because the costs of long transportation would be higher than the gained value from low density waste paper. Uh, I know that in his history of Soviet forest conversation, Stephen Brain has quite interestingly dem demonstrated early attempts at environmentalist forest protection under Stalin. But in the source materials that I have looked into in this connection uh, of waste paper, they do not include any like environmental arguments for setting up this uh, system. So if, if this did not really make sense from an economic perspective and not from an environmental perspective, the only possible way to explain the logic of the waste paper collecting system uh, 
is from a Stalinist ideological and social psychological perspective. And I assume that the semi-literate literature had very little used print material to donate, perhaps except from a family Bible and this kind of uh, um, print material. So uh, the rural waste paper collection was perhaps a more effective means of thought control than direct book confiscation would be because rather than provoking further peasant resistance, it would internalize a sense of shame or guilt by leaving it to the scrap donor to recategorize holy books or inherited print materials as waste paper. Although the Sayur Sutil organization may have looked more efficient on paper than in reality, at its height, the system actually enforced a doubling of the 1920s waste paper return rate of 9%, uh, which in the 1930s uh, reached levels between 17 and 21% of annual board and paper consumption. As you can see from this graph in the slide, I know that the copy is not uh, uh, the best. Um, <clears throat> You can see that by 1940, the waste paper return rate again drops down to 14.7%. And there are no data uh, available from the war years and also not from the post-war years of forced reconstruction. But by 1949, the return rate was down to only 10.5%. And only in the 19, early 1960s, the waste paper return rate again reached the level of, um, of 1936. So these declining figures indicate that the Soviet war economy largely abandoned the collecting system of waste paper by the 1940s. And several factors may have contributed to this development. First, uh, since the paper industry lacked proper equipment for the efficient reworking of waste paper, the actual economic effect of the 1930s irrationally hoarded waste paper resources was questionable. And second, uh, the pre-war purges of the management weakened the organization of the system. Uh, Third, the eventual outbreak of the war damaged the collection infrastructures. And fourth, um, the urgent paper scarcities um, made household reuse paper more uh, thoroughly. And then finally, and understandably, <clears throat> the public Soviet wartime attitude to resource mobilization remained quite ambiguous because salvage drives became negatively associated with the German occupation force. Uh, agitators would uh, make satire on, on top-down Nazi clothing drives, for example, that were uh, presented as total plunder, stripping the civil population bare, as you can see in these cartoons. Um, but in parallel, um, <clears throat> Um, propaganda also agitated for metal scrap collections at the home front. So if we look um, across different warring nations, Soviet waste paper collection actually developed exactly opposite uh, to the intensified wartime paper salvage drives among the allied partners in the West. Uh, for example, Peter Torsheim has demonstrated how paper salvage in Britain contributed to the mobilization of the home front uh, and to cellulose production for military needs, but at the same time destroyed British uh, library holdings. Um, in the USSR, the increasing paper scarcity made citizens preserve and reuse paper directly rather than continue contributing uh, to the centralized uh, collection. Uh, in summer and autumn 1941, during uh, uh, the evacuation um, 
Further limits were, of course, put to the uh, Soyuz Util office infrastructures and to their uh, activities during, during the war. Uh, they even had to write their own uh, evacuation lists on the reverse side of expired waste paper forms from the 1930s. Um, but correspondence between the central office and its regional branches and uh, the uh, People's Commissioner for the Light Industry continued during the war years. Um, but the correspondence reads almost like a deaf bureaucratic exchange because none of the local um, waste recovery offices are able to fulfill their required uh, quota. And the archive documents show that even uh, Leningrad um, by January 1943, when a land corridor was opened through uh, the Nazi forces encirclement of the city, then Leningrad was still expected to fulfill its waste paper quota. Uh, it had actually more than doubled since uh, it compared to its uh, pre-siege capacity. So according to state planning logic, the land corridor was not only intended for the much needed transport of supplies into the city, but also for returning any presumed scrap resources, including waste paper from the surviving population, and uh, possibly also remains from abandoned uh, book collections. In her book, um, The Besieged Leningrad that came out in 2017, Paulina Baskova has documented a very interesting from diary entries, how members of the urban intelligentsia even ate uh, books to gain nutrition from them. Um, the broken supply chains uh, forced both producers and consumers to retreat to local self-supplying units that relied on local strategies, decentralized strategies of replacing, reducing, remaking, and reusing paper. Um, the printing industry, for example, received only substandard uh, um, paper rolls due to, to scarcities of uh, paper components. So to soften the paper, um, the paper industry would use chalk to replace uh, unavailable uh, minerals and uh, the chalk made the paper hard and very inflexible which was very problematic especially for the rotation press because it caused uh, defective prints all the time and at the same time um, the paper plants received orders to reduce the weight of both um, newsprint and book printing paper to save resources. And this actually contributed to a further lowering of the production because workers had to slow down the machinery to avoid this thinner and more fragile paper from breaking during production. So in this vicious circle, uh, resource reduction risked res resulting in even more defective production waste. And then to avoid returning a valuable uh, excess or defective printed paper into the reutilization system, guidebooks instructed uh, printers how to remove uh, print color directly uh, with chalk and so on, and then to reprint directly on the reused uh, print sheets. Um, <clears throat> the steep production decline uh, forced the partly evacuated publishing and printing industry to introduce very radical resource saving uh, policy policies um, that, that, that were, went further than uh, what the industry had already been used to in the 1920s and 1930s. And on the right side of this slide, you can see a booklet from 1943 uh, for the strictest pay paper saving uh, in which a uh, publishing specialist, um, Vladimir Marcos, uh, condemns um, paper squandering. And I quote, he, he writes that, besides the serious material loss for the state, uh, 
to waste paper for nothing is not only intolerable, it is also criminal. And this booklet, um, you see the front page here, it's issued without a cover, without a title page. Uh, you can see that the pages are densely um, printed, there are minimal margins and uh, hardly any line spaces. But nevertheless, it is printed in 5,000 copies, which is quite a lot uh, for this type of uh, specialized literature. So this raises the question of how uh, paper saving were all these waste reduction uh, efforts in uh, reality. And on the left side on, on the slide, you can see an easy do-it-yourself receipt for small-scale paper making uh, that was uh, developed by two engineers. Um, they explain how uh, uh, ordinary people can sort old books and print, remove uh, clips and nails, and then uh, tear the scrap paper into small parts. And then at the illustration, they show how you can construct a small wooden cylinder and a top to blend the scratted and soaked paper with water and create your own paper. And this kind of low-tech backyard paper making um, appear almost incompatible with the large-scale industrialization efforts of the Stalinist economy. But it seems like that the low-tech skills and the large-scale ambitions complement each other here and that the state actually require from its paper consumers uh, that they participate in the production of print materials. To publishers, also the post-press paper circulation represented a problem. For example, a former uh, war correspondent uh, recalled the editorial headache of conserving newspapers that often went up in smoke before ever getting to the reader. And he explained that you smoked the newspaper, especially in newsprint, not just plain paper was spent on roll your own cigarettes. And this was very valuable. And this quote testify to how readers pragmatically reused the war press in unintended, alternative, and ideology-depriving ways that could not be controlled from the sender side. Um, old newsprint had a high informal trade value because it was appropriated into sanitary paper used as fuel, as packaging material, uh, for insulation of boots and clothes, uh, for windows and water pipes, and so on. And these practices are, of course, not exclusive to the war period, um, but the, the reuse practices gained an urgent importance for fulfilling the population's primary needs of keeping warm, clean, and protected, rather than the secondary uh, symbolic or ideological needs of reading and um, or paper scrap collecting. So these profane examples add a different perspective, but uh, they do not reduce the significance of cultural consumption of print publications during the war. For example, uh, the notion of the healing powers of paper was evoked by a patriotic campaign uh, during which volunteers collected 4.5 million books that a librarian network redistributed to hospital libraries and to uh, soldiers and so on. <clears throat> and the, this campaign also figured on in propaganda photos, as you can see on the right side of, of this slide, which kind of highlights how culture is brought into uh, the world of war. So I, I just want to to sum up by saying that in the 1930s, the Stalinist regime aimed at optimizing its scrap collecting and recovery system, Sayus Util, and thereby they literally 
created a union of utilization um, by turning waste pickers into disciplined, cultured brigade workers and assembling households into collecting collectives. Now, the moral economy of this system was not necessarily economically efficient. It discarded technical waste recovery experts. It excessively wasted virgin pulp, wool, pulp, uh, virgin pulp wood in paper production. It destroyed millions of so-called non-useful pre-revolutionary books and archival records in waste paper campaigns and so on. Um, these efforts all had an ideological and symbolic significance, while an actual economic effect is difficult to prove. And in any case, I don't think it's, it was the primary uh, motivation behind uh, Sayus Util. And when it comes to uh, an environmental uh, um, motivation, I have not been able to, to uh, identify any like green thoughts behind this uh, system. But at the out outbreak of war, the Sayur Sutil system declined uh, because the evacuation of the paper and waste recovery industries increased infrastructural obstacles and delivery orders simply could not be fulfilled. Instead, the war press and printing industry retreated to reduction strategies while the technical educational literature uh, represented waste as an economic crime against the state. Um, the printing houses repaired or bleached defective used print sheets on site and re-entered them into production, um, thereby actually potentially increasing the waste of labor and material resources. Um, the population followed local self-supply and reuse strategies that were sanctioned by the state which issued do-it-yourself booklets in pre-industrial papermaking. And the flexible medium of printing paper served as substitute material for a number of other daily missing items. Uh, and although ideological newsprint went up in smoke, uh, decentralized the volunteer networks redistributed books and newspapers from the center to the peripheries. So the pre-war waste recovery dictate was replaced by a frequent header on uh, wartime publications, pass it on after reading. And I think this imperative of pass it on after reading, together with the criminalization of paper waste, uh, contributed to the post-war sacralization of uh, books and also contributed to the special paper saving layout. Um, this reinterpretation of paper and its value reflected, um, was reflected both in some of the post-war monumental book editions um, that were made um, based on high quality paper deliveries from Finland and Germany that were paid as uh, um, part of the war reparation. And it also contributed to the late Soviet urban educated populations, uh, apartment interiors that were crammed with these hoarded books. So uh, th I think I'm gonna end here and I want to, to thank you for, for your attention. I should say that if uh, this presentation has not totally scared all of you away, um, there is a planned special issue coming next year in the Journal of Business History uh, because um, uh, this study here is, is part of a larger uh, transnational research project on waste in war economies. Um, and uh, we have a special issue edited by Heike Weber and Chad Denton um, with a lot of different case stories, uh, case, case studies of different materials, um, not only from the Soviet Union, but also from Nazi Germany and the US and UK and Japan and Korea. So you can look forward to this if you're interested in the topic.
Thank you.